Welcome, everyone, to the Gridiron Review Podcast. I'm Zach, that's Jack, and we are glad to have you all here and are excited to be a part of your NFL off-season coverage. In this episode, we will be breaking down every team situation heading into their off-season. We will be discussing cap space, draft position, and number of picks, as well as positive, neutrals, and negatives in regards to positional groups. And lastly, we will discuss free agent fits and top prospect fits, specifically in the first round for now. The next team in the draft order at pick 19, their actual pick being the last of their three firsts is the Philadelphia Eagles. The Eagles, surprise playoff team of the year, many would say. I mean, besides, I guess, Cincinnati. But throughout the year, it just felt like Philly was going to fall short, and somehow they made it. They have $22.5 million, million in cap space, ranking 13th in the league. They have key free agents of Jason Kelsey, who may or may not retire. It's really up in the air right now. And it doesn't seem like Sirianni's two beer kegs have really swayed him towards returning. Might need to add a third one there. Rodney McLeod, Anthony Harris, their two starting safeties. Derek Barnett, probably not resigning because he's not that good. And Steven Nelson, who I believe is their third string like their third corner, sometimes two, depending on who is injured. As I mentioned, they have an extra two first with the Carson Wentz trade and the Dolphins trade up for Tua, I believe, is the other part of that. They have an extra second. They do not have a fourth. They have an extra sixth and no seventh. Positives on this team are the running backs. While they don't have any super, super standout guys, the way they run their offense it's not necessary. They have a lot of guys that complement each other well. And really, they they were the number one, or I don't know if they finished, but they were the number one rushing team in the league for most of the year for a reason. And that's because, I mean, yeah, I guess you could say Jalen Hurts a little bit, but we'll talk about him later. They really do a good job of putting together a committee that all works well off of each other. Tight end, besides Dallas Goddard, who's a very fine number one, they have uh, Tyree Jackson, who seems like a positive developmental piece that if he could stay healthy, he may be a big difference maker at the number two spot. Maybe they add another tight end, a lower level veteran or a mid-round draft pick, but as it stands right now, you could go into next season with the guys they have and be perfectly fine. The offensive line is also a strength, despite the retirements and Jason Kelsey's status up in the air. They had really good backups in place. And again, they probably add another high-end draft pick with one of their first. But even if they didn't, you would feel good about the line. Maybe not the backups, but the starters. Neutral positions are quarterback. And for me, this is more about their backup being Gardner Minshew than it is about Hurts. This is going to be a long, you know, I could go forever on about Hurts. Listen, for the defenders, if you're not defending him saying he's a good leader, then you're in the wrong here. And that's my opinion. He is not a good thrower of the football, and I just don't know how you think he is. He does not get through reads fast enough. He is very late getting to the deep ball, and he targeted Rager too much. It just is the truth. You can argue all you want. I've seen some people blame, you know, Sirianni for Devontae Smith not getting the ball. But if you watched it in the playoff game, they ended up having to throw screens to Smith because otherwise Hurts wasn't looking his way. When you have your your first round receiver, one of the most decorated college receivers of all time, slamming his helmet in frustration multiple games in the year because he's not he's wide open and not getting looked at, that is a problem. Hertz is not the feature. You know, he's a good running quarterback. He's a good leader, but he's just not a good thrower of the football. And the offense, frankly, in my opinion, looked better when Minshew was out there. That may be controversial. That may be how a lot of people agree. But I don't understand how people are fighting at the bit saying Hurts is a top 15 quarterback. He's not. Maybe he's back into the top 20, but even then, quarterbacks need to throw the ball first. All right. And Hurts just, they had such a weak schedule, and he still was an average at best against some of the worst defenses in the league. And you know, I could do a whole hour plus podcast on on why he's not the future. And I, I really believe that Philly makes a big push to a trade for a quarterback. Whether it happens or not, I don't know. I know they committed to Hurts, but if you have a chance to go get Deshaun, if he's cleared, if you have a chance to go get Russell Wilson, you do it. And for the people that somehow convince themselves that Russell Wilson is not a better option than Jalen Hurts, I don't know what you're doing. Maybe you don't really know football. Maybe you feel it's not worth giving up the picks. But if you think the Eagles are not due, if they go in with this roster, with Hurts at quarterback, even with the three firsts, they're due for major regression. You could make the argument that they are in line to be the worst team in the East because with the Giants having Dable and Kafka and Martindale, they probably take a big step forward. And Washington greatly underperformed their defense, so they could be back in the mix. You could see the Eagles finishing last in the division. So I, I just think Eagles fans, some of you, it's very divisive. Some of you see Hurts for who he is. Some of you overly hate Hurts. And some of you think he's the next coming of, I don't know, Donovan McNabb, who knows. But it's just, he, Hertz isn't the answer. He could be a really good mentor to a rookie. He could start this year 
for a rookie, but really it depends on who you take. Anyone besides Malik Willis doesn't make sense, but anyway, that's a lot of ranting. Their defensive line is okay. Their tackles specifically are good with Hargrave, Fletcher, and Milton Williams especially down the line look, or down the stretch look very good. They could use an end slash edge rusher with Brandon Graham being super old and Barnett gone. There's one draft prospect that makes a lot of sense here if he's there, and we'll cover that in a second. And their defensive backs are, their corners are okay. Darius Slay had a really good year, but beyond him, like a, Maddox signed an extension, but how do you, are you comfortable with that as a fan? As an organization, I don't know that I would be. Uh, you know, I don't think Maddox is a good two. He's probably an okay three. McPherson had some ups and downs, but he was only a fourth rounder, so you're not tied to him to start, although he could start, I suppose. You probably need more more bodies in the corner room, but the big issue is that both of your starting safeties are free agents, and you've got to sign or draft two of them. And then needs to be addressed is wide receiver. Devontae Smith, obviously good, but beyond him is not good. Quez Watkins is an okay piece in the room. He's not a two. He's probably not even a three. He's probably a very good number four. Uh, Jalen Rager, everybody knows. Everybody knows. J.J. Arcega, Whiteside, everybody knows. They've got to be gone. I don't know what you benefit from keeping him. You can trade him for anything. As Jack noted in our article about non-quarterbacks, if you get a call with someone offering to cater your draft room with Chick-fil-A for Jalen Rieger, you probably take it. And Arcega Whiteside, I just don't see him. I just think he's cut. And linebackers, the Eagles are notorious for having a bunch of bottom of the bin linebackers. TJ Edwards was okay. He is doable. He probably starts next year, but you need at least two other linebackers in that room. How will this this team be addressed? First with a free agency. Now, again, the Eagles have 22 million, which is decent. So we think they make a big swing at safety and go after Jesse Bates or Justin Reed. But I, I think they make an offer for Bates. I think he being a deep, I believe a deep safety and just being one of the best of the position. I know he had a down year, but in the playoffs, he showed up when it mattered. And I think this is a person, he's young. You could sign him to a long-term deal and not worry about it turning sour as long as you don't. It's not crazy money. They need a receiver. And I've said all along, as soon as I saw him as a free agent, DJ Chark just makes too much sense to me. He gives you size and speed, something you're missing both of. And if for whatever reason Chark is outpriced, because again, Chark is also very young. And he just, it just makes sense to me. I just get it done. But if for whatever reason he signs elsewhere because they don't want to catch passes from Jalen Hurts, I think that's going to be a problem for a lot of the free agents. Just saying, you might see that. Mike Williams also makes sense, again, if he feels comfortable, if he cares about money over catching passes from Hurts. Mike Williams being, I think, 6'5", would be a huge body to throw to. And actually, unlike our Seagull Whiteside, proven. And then we also see them signing one linebacker that can fill Jernard Avery's role, that can drop back and also pat, rush the passer. Uh, Anthony Barr, as a veteran presence, or as an upside pick, Van Der Esch, plus you'd be plucking him from the Cowboys, which always is a good thing. In the draft, if he's available... George Karlofitis makes so much sense here. I could see them using one of their higher firsts to take him, maybe trading up a couple picks using a later pick at pair with it. Trayvon Walker has an inside-outside versatility on the line, and it depends on how you feel about Jermaine Johnson, whether he can do that as well with the versatility. The big offensive line pick to watch here is Tyler Linderbaum. Uh, there's a report I saw where he's projected to possibly be a 10-year pro baller right off the bat, and that would just continue this off offensive line success that the Eagles have had regardless for a very long time and transitioning from Kelsey to Linderbaum would be perfect. And then lastly, if, if all else fails and you're looking to take that missing receiver, Drake London is probably the guy. Assuming Traylon Burks is gone, London is 6'5", he, he adds the size, and he should be what everyone hoped their Sega wide side would be. And it's, again, if you're really insistent on rolling with Jalen Hurts, he's a huge body that on the bad throws should be able to make the adjustments. Now, before we uh, move on to the next pick, Jack has some words to say about the Eagles, I'm sure. I mean, there's plenty to be said about this team and its issues and I think Zach highlights it pretty well is linebacker is rough. Defensive back is rough. I mean, I watched Maddox get abused towards the end of the year. I, I'm not comfortable with Maddox being my two, and I'm very skeptical, skeptical of him being my three, but you paid him. So either he's got to step up or maybe you got to get rid of him because that was not a good display of football he put on at the end of the year. I don't want to take – uh, too much time to go over the Eagles. Zach did a very nice job of breaking them down, but 
I do want to circle back to the Jalen Hurts conversation. And for me, it dates back to college. Hurts is sitting in a room with a guy like Tua and wins the job. And I mean, as a Georgia fan, it's going to pain me to talk about this. However, there's a reason that Tua was put into the game in the national championship and put the dagger in Georgia. It's because he could throw the ball. And I get that Tua doesn't look like he can do that in the league right now. But when Georgia stacked the box and stopped Hurts, he was a one-trick pony. That, That was when Georgia really had their time to try to seal that game. If not for Tua... Georgia probably has two national championships in the last five, five, six years. And as a Georgia fan, that's great. But you watch Tua steal that job from Hertz in, at Alabama the following year. And to Zach's point, Hertz is a great leader. He's a great guy to work with because he was Tua's biggest supporter when even when he lost that job. But then you see him transfer to Oklahoma. And I'm sorry, Big 12 fans, but you guys do not play defense like Anyone who thinks that Big 12 defense is relevant, like, please stop talking. They're terrible, man. I mean, you guys put up like 60 a week. That's just unacceptable. And I get maybe that's why people see college football as more enjoyable, but that's not the point here. Hurge went to Oklahoma, who had a history of quarterbacks like Baker Mayfield and Kyler Murray, and went on, uh, I believe he won the Heisman. And maybe you saw something a little more from the past game there. But as I just noted, the Big 12 doesn't play defense. So Hurts struggled to throw the ball against the SEC and then goes and looks like a real quarterback at Oklahoma. But you're talking about two completely different ends of the spectrum in terms of college football defenses. And as he transitions into the league, I'm starting to see more of the Alabama Hurts than I am the Oklahoma Hurts because this isn't Big 12 defense. Hurts has a multitude of issues. And again, this is me and Zach's opinions. You don't have to agree with us. But yeah, Hertz didn't have the greatest weapons in the world. Yeah, you you gave him JJR, Siegel, Whiteside, and Jalen Rager. Yeah, okay. That, that's a huge... That's a huge problem. But you bring in a number one like Devontae Smith. And to Zach's point, Hertz is out here forcing the ball to Rieger. And I don't know if we've mentioned this before, but I am not a huge Sirianni fan. So this isn't me trying to be biased, but if you are in the NFL as an offensive mind, I can assure you that Sirianni is drawing up plays that is getting Devontae Smith the ball if the quarterback goes through his reads correctly. I get that Smith is small and he's not the alpha typical number one receiver that you might think of. Like when you think of ones, you think of Megatrons and Julios and D-Hop. You don't think of... of skinny guys like Devontae Smith. But Devontae Smith has some wicked route running and and release. And you saw that against top guys in college. He put these guys on skates. And we see it. Devontae Smith is getting open. And he's getting frustrated to Zach's point. You don't see guys slamming their helmets on the ground for no reason. Just go back and watch Eagles games. Smith is getting open. And Hurts is either not seeing him or overthrowing him, or or just choosing to go somewhere else. And we saw it at the end of the Tampa game. They had to force Devontae, uh, Devontae Smith the ball on screens, and you can't be doing that in the league. Maybe it works in college, but you can't force the ball to people in the league. It, you're going to face the consequences of that. But even if you want to look at, like, for people who understand football better than others, All you have to do is watch Jalen Hurts. Forget the weapons around him. He's consistently leaving the pocket early. He consistently has his head down. He's not looking downfield. And the truth of the matter is, yeah, I get it. Quarterbacks are going to miss throws. But Jalen Hurts is missing wide open receivers in the end zone. And we saw it in the Tampa Bay game. His throwing mechanics are not there. His throwing mechanics have nothing to do with his receivers. The truth of the matter is, me and Zach are no quarterback, but I'm I'm pretty confident I could have hit an open receiver in the end zone. Again, I'm, that's a pretty bold statement, but there's no reason why you should be missing guys in the end zone. Now, whether that touchdown would have made a difference in that game, I'm going to say probably not, but it's just, it's an unacceptable thing. And I get that his mentor coming into the league was Carson Wentz, who, as I'm pretty sure we noted, has character concerns. Maybe he wasn't teaching him. But is Wentz really the guy you want teaching Jalen Hurts anyways? Jalen Hurts has a lot of work to do. And the point is, Josh Allen had the same concerns coming out of college. They didn't think he could throw the ball. And Allen has more arm strength than Jalen Hurts could ever imagine. But look at the strides that Josh Allen has made in his first, I believe it's three three years, 
Yeah. He's an MVP caliber quarterback. Yeah. His name wasn't in the race this year. But there's no reason it shouldn't be going forward. The dude can still run the way he did in college. He's still one of the best running quarterbacks in the league. And I get it. Hertz does that well. But there's no reason that Hertz can't throw the ball, like, maybe not to the extent of Allen, but at a decent, um, I guess, a decent rate. I don't, I don't know what the correct word would be there. But you just watch the guys that are making strides around the league who come out as running quarterbacks. And Hertz is just... He's not making improvements. Everyone's like, oh, well, Hertz, uh, there's the stat that Hertz gets better every year. That might not necessarily be the greatest thing because if you're making big strides every year, that means that there's a lot of problems there. And to Zach's point, if you can go get a veteran guy like Wilson, I have no issue with you keeping Hertz because someone like that will mentor. Like Wilson is one of the best guys in the league. He will absolutely mentor Hertz the way you need him to. But Hertz needs to be willing to put in the extra work in the offseason to improve the way that guys like Josh Allen did. And I don't know if Zach has anything to comment on further. All right, so moving right along, the next pick is the other Pennsylvania team. And I apologize for this podcast episode, but we are about to just abuse the Pennsylvania teams because the Pittsburgh Steelers, the fact that they have been in playoff contention the last two years is a joke. It's an absolute joke. They are the worst 11-0 team of all time. Before we start seeing smoke come out my ears, I'm going to just start talking about the team. They have $32 million in cap, which ranks ninth in the league. Their key free agents are Hayden, Juju, if we want to consider him a key free agent, Tri Turner, multiple backup receivers such as James Washington, Ebron, Terrell Edmonds. This is a team that has no fifth, from we believe it was the Joe Schobert trade and an extra seventh. So, I mean, pretty much just a, a normal draft. The running backs are obviously a positive here. Najee showed out in his first year, and you have solid backups like Snell and McFarland behind them. Tight end is a positive. Fryermuth looked really good in his first year. When he was out, Zach Entry didn't look too bad. Maybe a guy you take a shot on, maybe with that extra seventh round pick, but it's not something that needs to be addressed right away. In terms of the positions that need to be addressed right away, it's quarterback, very, very obviously quarterback. And I mean, Zach and I talk about the quarterback carousel almost every day now. And Zach brought up a good point the other night about the Pittsburgh quarterback situation is Pittsburgh is coming out and saying that they're comfortable with a guy like Rudolph or a guy like Haskins starting next year. And if you aren't willing to win next year, I would agree with that. But Zach made the point of if you're Mike Tomlin, this organization due to him being not just a a Steelers legend, but a league legend in Ben Roethlisberger, having to watch him throw the ball 70 times to get 200 yards, if even, how are you not going up to the owner and being like, I'm not running with with the rag ass arm of a quarterback again like this is like this is my team I need a guy that I can win with and Najee is an incredible running back not just in the run game but they used him so much in the past game this year he's such a threat out of the backfield but I mean Ben looked at him almost every throw because Ben's arm isn't going down the field anymore and I think if you roll with a Rudolph or a Haskins you're gonna see the same type of sad offense that we've watched the last two two or three years now with Ben and you just you can't do that for Tomlin's sake for for some of these guys that deserve to go out and win like Cam Hayward and TJ Watt and whether it's it's draft or you bring in a veteran through a trade like Jimmy Garoppolo which we believe actually makes the most sense here or it just you can't roll with Rudolph I don't even think you can roll with Rudolph as a backup it's like it's it's just a joke and I think the fact that he got hit with a helmet by Miles Garrett just describes his career in the NFL and it's not funny that well it is funny that he got hit in the the head with a helmet however he's not that guy and I was high off Rudolph when he was coming out of Oklahoma State but I I quickly learned that he's not the guy and if the organization does not let Tomlin choose a quarterback of his liking I could see Tomlin being a guy that requests a trip not a trade to be released because there's no reason why you should force him to to use a quarterback that isn't worth it you you did it to him for two years and somehow they managed to be in playoff contention now whether they deserve to be there absolutely not they 
they should be they should have had a top 10 pick each of the last few years but that's beyond the point um i don't know if zach wants to throw anything in there about the quarterback before i move on no all right um in terms of things that need to be addressed o-line i think that this unit definitely did better as the year progressed but there's some major issues on that line that need to be resolved here and i think that it's got to be behind quarterback the biggest priority because bj finney your center is really the biggest name starter there and uh that's pretty sad because Finney is a backup nearly anywhere else and position to be addressed right away defensive back Hayden's a free agent and aging I don't know even know that you bring him back um honestly I'm not even quite sure who else sits in that room at the moment I think Justin Lane but the it just it needs a lot of work especially teams a team like Cincinnati sitting there with T Higgins Tyler Boyd and Jamar Chase Justin Lane is going to get cooked he's going to start looking like Eli Apple if if you let him be out there alone in terms of like the the mid uh, positions on this team, each wide receiver, if Deontay Johnson can fix his hands, I arguably think he could be a top three slot in this league. His route running is incredible. And he made a lot of progress early in this season with his hands. But as you went down the stretch, it just seemed like he returned to 2020 form and you can't have that happen. There was so much promise there. And if he has another season of drops, I think they, they start to lose hope in him. He loses his starting role, might get traded, might get cut. He needs to put in a lot of work this offseason on his hands. And typically for receivers, it's other stuff like route running and stuff his route running is incredible he needs to work on catching the ball and it starts with just looking the ball in like very very simple stuff that you you teach at the youth level um neutral positions d-line cam hayward and to it although i think to it needs to be a piece that's moved owed 14 million dollars this year i believe this is his last year on contract however if you could clear up his space uh that would be an incredible move on your part maybe pick up an extra mid-round pick for him but Hayward needs some help on that D-line and I think they have great backups guys like Wormley and Loudermilk but I don't think that either of those guys are ready to start and positive is linebacker I mean I have it under neutral here I think I think I screwed up the document for that one. But TJ Watt and Highsmith on the outside. Now, whether you think Highsmith is going to develop or not is yet to be seen. It's his first year in the league. So give him a little time. Let's see what he's made of. And then you got guys like Bush and Schober in the middle. Obviously, Bush has taken a step back since returning from his injury. But it's kind of expected. His big thing coming out of college was his speed. And for you to tear your ACL I believe that's what it was you return and to be less fast you're just getting bullied I mean he's he's a very small linebacker predicated on speed and if he can find a way to get some of that speed back maybe he returns to form or maybe if he doesn't they find a way to replace him or find a different role for him like maybe you roll with Spillane and Schobert because Spillane has done an incredible job in the last two years and it sounds it sounds stupid to bench Bush for Spillane but if you can put Bush in on third downs where he doesn't have to be in the box and try to fight off blocks he can just be pass coverage that might be a a really good role for him but Schobert was for fifth round pick was a steal for them and Jacksonville is stupid for letting a guy like that go for so low but I mean to a point that Zach made to me the other day is the linebacker market in terms of trades is is really sad guys like Schobert should not be going for a fifth round pick and I'm not saying he's a second second round third round guy but like fourth late third 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 with something else included like the the linebacker trade market just isn't right in the league. Um, in terms of best free agent fits, we think definitely cornerback needs to be addressed. The obvious answer here, like anyone with a cornerback need, is J.C. Jackson coming off a seven-pick season, second behind Trevon Diggs. Um, would be a real nice option to pair with Lane and hopefully you bring in even somebody else because again that secondary needs a lot of work but a guy like Rasul Douglas stood out to us a guy who starts his career in Philly and everyone is is screaming for his head being a bust goes to Green Bay mid-season and becomes this all pro corner and now whether that's on the Eagles DB's coach not being able to develop which seems to be a consistent theme with the Eagles organization in general or the fact that Douglas is figuring it out he is still a one-year wonder the problem is it seems 
like the Steelers are very known to try to sign one year wonders. And my prime example here would be Steven Nelson coming from Kansas City a couple years back. But they also need safety help. We think one of the versatile safeties here makes a lot of sense to pair with Fitzpatrick, Tyron Matthew, Jabril Pepper, someone like that that can roll the box, play a little bit of nickel dime, kind of whatever you need from him, and a wide receiver. So, I mean, while we're sitting here, I mean, I talked about Deontay Johnson, but Chase Claypool has all the physical traits to be a top five, top 10 receiver in this league. The fact that he's not yet is, to me, a giant concern. And my biggest problem with him is all the offseason stuff he does, the TikToks, the this, the that. And I think that goes to the people that he's worked under. Since he's come into the league, his his mentors have been Antonio Brown and Juju Smith-Schuster. Antonio Brown, I don't even need to go into that. I mean, the dude took off his clothes and started dancing around MetLife like it was dancing with the stars. And Juju is apparently is this TikTok star that some people only know because of TikTok. Why is that why Chase Claypool got into TikTok? Who knows? But that's not the point here. There's guys like AJ Dillon who are on TikTok, but it, it's not why they're known. Dillon is more known for being the backup of arguably one of the best running back rooms in the NFL. There's guys you can be on TikTok without having that be your claim to fame. We think that in free agency, you have to bring in a veteran guy to mentor Claypool, not just on the field, but off the field. Like get him to be the receiver talent that everyone knows that he should be based on his traits. A guy that can teach him the ways of the game as Claypool, when he was coming out of Notre Dame, was what they were calling a project receiver. Um, In terms of the receiver room, still needs to be addressed. There needs to be someone out there with... Johnson and Claypool. We think a guy like Gallup makes a lot of sense, Uh, a deep threat type guy, uh, big on the outside uh, with a decent amount of speed, or even a cheaper uh, high upside pick like Christian Kirk. A little bit, as Zach has has talked about him before, can do a little bit of everything. Could be a nice guy for whoever your quarterback is. In terms of the draft fits, um, we think that it could also be quarterback. Um, Maybe you use your first round pick to trade for one of the big name guys on the market. Uh, If you don't, if Willis is here, it seems like the Steelers are very high on Malik Willis. Personally, if you think that this team is going to take a step back, then yeah, Willis might not be a bad option. But if Tomlin is under the belief that this is still a team that can win now and make the playoffs and make a run, it needs to be one of the more ready quarterbacks. And to me, and I know Zach here more thinks it's Willis if he sits here, I, th- I personally think it's Howell. Howell is a 6'1 quarterback, so he's not all that tall, but he's a pretty well-built quarterback. He's really strong. I think that in terms of how he stands in the pocket and shakes guys off from getting a sack, you could see maybe remnants of Big Ben here. However, unlike Big Ben, Howell brings a rushing aspect to a team that with a rushing quarterback could make this one of the most explosive offenses in football. If you let Howell sit back there and run RPO with Najee, it opens up holes. I mean, you couldn't run RPO with Ben. If you run RPO, you gotta your your linebackers have to read that. You open up things for slants like Deontay Johnson and Claypool coming across the middle. This offense could be opened up so much more with a guy like Howell or even with Willis if he's sitting here that has the ability to take off. Um, in terms of other draft fits, if Linderbaum is here, I I don't think he gets past Philly, but if he does, makes a lot of sense here. You could move BJ Finney to guard or something. It just, there needs to be pieces added to this offensive line. And if you want to go defense, maybe it's a guy like Devontae Wyatt. He had a nice senior season with the Bulldogs in Georgia. He went out and had an incredible week at the Senior Bowl. And maybe, depending on how he tests, he becomes a guy that isn't necessarily too much a reach here. And you compare him to work with uh, Cam Hayward on that defensive line. But that's all we got for the Steelers. And Zach, take it away. At pick 21, we have the New England Patriots. They have the 19th most cap space from $7.3 million. Their key free agents are longtime starting safety Devin McCourty, Trent Brown, J.C. Jackson, Juwan Bentley, Dante Hightower, and James White. They do not have a fifth 
or seventh round pick, but otherwise they have everything else and no extra picks. Their positives are quarterback. Obviously, Mac Jones had a very good year above what people thought. Whether his upside is capped is unknown. However, he probably starts for a couple of years going forward at the least. Their running back room with Damian Harris and Ramondre Stevenson is pretty strong. They probably add a pass catcher, but really it's it's a good one-two punch. Their tight end room with Hunter Henry, <clears throat> John New Smith, and Devin Asiasi and Don Keen is very strong. Now, I think John New Smith might be moved, but even without him, Hunter Henry and Devin Asiasi is a good one too. Then their offensive line is strong with Trent Brown, a free agent. You'd think they re-sign him. Even if they don't, it's still a pretty good group that they probably address the tackle some other way. Wide receiver is a neutral position. They have a lot of bodies. However, they're missing that clear alpha. And if they add that, then it suddenly becomes a pretty strong group with Kendrick Bourne and uh, Jacoby Myers and Nelson Aguilar. They have a nice room going. They just, like I said, they're missing that big presence. The defensive line is the same way. They have a lot of depth pieces. They have a lot of role players, but they're missing that edge setter or that you know their their tackles are Godshaw and Barmore but at the edge on the outside they're missing that elite pass rusher and they haven't had one for a while so they might not even address it they might just keep on with a bunch of rotational guys and their defensive backs they without McCordy they're missing a clear deep safety they have a few uh, box safety slash linebacker hybrids that probably don't play both of the safety spots so you'd have to wait and see how they figure out maybe they just resign McCordy on a friendly deal to keep him a patriot it's on known at the moment and it needs to be addressed their linebacker room they're losing their two inside backers their outside backers are okay beyond judon just two things i wanted to mention is anthony jennings and josh uche have kind of disappeared after being pretty decently high draft picks for the patriots and i'm just wondering like whether they actually have a role this year or if they're just going in another direction as far as free agents go christian kirk he's not the, the alpha that they need but he's another receiver that you know belichick and the patriots crave versus and Kirk can be slot he can be deep threat he can be inside outside it makes a lot of sense and if they don't decide to go after a big guy I think they sign another middle of the road wide receiver to just make it a room full of guys that could get the ball at any moment without someone clearly there to to focus on Hassan Reddick slash other edge rushers make sense yeah I don't know that they can afford Hassan Reddick again they only have 7.3 million in cap space and that's without resigning any of their guys so if they're going to go edge I see them taking a chance on a guy that used to be or we see them taking a chance on someone that used to be a highly touted prospect and draft profile and had a few good years but it's kind of trailed off and that's Dante Fowler he's still I believe 27 or 28 and as everyone knows he was once a very high pick and maybe Belichick and the Patriots unlock the most of him who knows in the draft we think they I mean the first the first has got to be wide receiver Drake London Traylon Burks now maybe we're getting too far back to take one of them they might be gone by now so I still think they look wide receiver but we haven't done enough study to figure who who is probably the next man up if you're looking for like a size guy at the uh, X receiver or the outside receiver and then if they decide not to they just probably add another depth piece at on the D line but everyone knows the Patriots they probably draft I mean they probably trade back or maybe they just trade out of the first completely um, it, there's a lot of questions Belichick spent a lot of money last year in free agency I don't think he does that again I mean he can't but I also think that was a weird thing and unless they clear cap space stuff they're not going to be making any big moves so we will have to see what they decide to do and we're going to keep the ball rolling with uh, Jack go ahead the next pick in the draft is the Las Vegas Raiders. Um, first note is they should probably move out of Vegas with all the NFL players dealing with issues in Vegas. Um, but assuming they stay, they have $21 million in cap, which ranks 14th in the league. Uh, key free agents include primarily depth pieces. In terms of starters, Casey Hayward, Jonathan Hankins, Quentin Jefferson are all guys that you lose uh, KJ Wright as well. And we were talking, uh, that seems like a free agent signing that should have had a little bit more hype around it. We didn't even know that he was on the team. But you lose depth pieces like Zay Jones and Solomon Thomas, who really seem to break out this year as a role player for the Raiders and Mariota. And it just seems like, for the most part, the starters, now whether you consider them starters or not, like the receiver room, are intact. It just seems like you need to go get depth for, for most of your players. Places. They have an extra fifth and no sixth. Their positives are the backfield. Carr had another really nice season. And as we talked about in the Coaching Carousel podcast, like I truly do believe that Josh McDaniels has the potential to be the best coaching hire of this year's group. 
I think that car fits a New England scheme really well. And if McDaniels continues to bring that over, I think he could unlock uh, something in car that we haven't seen yet. But running back, Kenyon Drake and Josh Jacobs, I for a running back that they paid a decent amount of money to, Drake did not see as many touches as you would have thought. But I think McDaniels bringing in a, a running back committee type style like New England, there's very clearly a role for somebody like Kenyon Drake in that system. And maybe you take a, a third guy in the se- sixth or seventh round, just take a shot and add him to the room. In terms of things that need to be addressed right away, wide receiver, poor Hunter Renfro's back must really hurt for carrying that room all season long. Um, O-line. <laughs> The starters didn't seem to be all that bad. There seems to be an injury problem there and an aging problem. That's And even in terms of depth, it's just not there. This is a room that if you want to run the football and you want to keep Carr protected, needs to be upgraded severely. Defensive back, Casey Hayward's gone. And uh, I mean, me and Zach didn't watch enough Raiders games to be able to make a decision on Mowrig and how he did this year. But Jonathan Abram seems like he can't stay healthy and another uh John Gruden and Mike Mayock boss I think the kid has a lot of upside but his injury problems are just beyond help right now in terms of like the middle of the road positions tight end and most of you are probably thinking hey Darren Waller is a top three five tight whatever whatever your opinion on him is however if he gets hurt again I don't believe that Foster Moreau is the guy that's supposed to replace him and again to the McDaniels point if he brings in a Patriot system maybe you run a lot more two tight end looks so you definitely need another guy Moreau is a nice two three but um, definitely could add a guy there Uh, defensive line your edge rushers are incredible nice depth you have Ngakwe and Crosby and uh, Farrell who I believe Zach mentioned one of the other podcasts is a bust for where he was taken but is a nice backup for the Raiders and linebacker from what I heard uh, Divine Diablo had a very nice rookie season you still have guys like Littleton and Nick Kwiatkowski who were signed in the same offseason there as backups or guys that could take on maybe that third starting linebacker role Denzel Perryman uh, brought in from Carolina and ended up being a pro bowler this year it's a a very solid room to say the least maybe you're missing a starter or maybe you're missing a big name there but not necessarily the biggest of needs in terms of how we think it'll be addressed in free agency this is a team that screams Devontae Adams first off the Raiders would have to clear a little bit more cap especially depending on what Adams is looking for but they need an alpha one and clearly Adams is that and I don't know how many people know this or not but Derek Carr and Devontae Adams were teammates at Fresno State for Adams with all the question marks in Green Bay is it Rodgers is it Love is it whoever maybe he walks away and finds a quarterback with familiarity on a team with with what we saw this year, a lot of upside. If it's not Adams, I still think you got to look at a receiver here. Maybe someone like Allen Robinson, um, big bodied guy can be the one and he's got enough experience in the league where maybe he can teach a thing or two to someone like Brian Edwards who might be able to work his way into that number two role. And this one's a little bit out there, but as I mentioned a couple of times already, if McDaniels brings in this Patriot two tight end offense, someone like Mike Gusecki could make a lot of sense here. I know that he's not the best run blocker, but if you... Um, if you have him as a two and Waller gets hurt, now he's your one and he brings in another element to the pass game. And for a team that needs receiver help, it just, it brings a different perspective of how to fix the issue because I get that Renfro is a slot, but if you can have Renfro on the outside with Waller and Gasecki in the slots of a two tight end formation, that solves the issues in just a different way. In terms of draft fits, we think you might look receiver here. Even if you look for a receiver in the free agent market, someone like Garrett Wilson, who brings a little bit more speed to his game on the outside. I know I've mentioned him a couple of times already, but Devontae Wyatt, if he's still sitting here, this is about where he's supposed to go. The Raiders are going to need a lot of help inside to take the pressure off Crosby and Ngakwe. This is the guy that could do it. And without film, it's hard to tell where the corner rankings stand, but Sauce and Stanley very clearly are out of the picture at this point. However, maybe if Booth falls or 
a guy like McDuffie or McCreary, if they're still sitting here, maybe you take a shot on them because right now Hobbs had a very nice rookie season. I mean, he got arrested for, I believe it was DUI, another reason why Las Vegas needs to move. Um, but Hobbs, Hobbs can be a starter in this league from a football aspect. And Trayvon Mullen is another guy they have in that room. A standout at Clemson just hasn't been what everyone expected him to be in the league, but he's still a solid starter, particularly in the slot. Maybe one of these guys can take in that other outside corner spot, but that's about all we have on the Raiders. They are going to be a very interesting team to watch this offseason and this year, and I'm going to send it over to Zach. The Arizona Cardinals have picked 23 this year and plenty of controversy heading into the offseason. They rank 23rd in the league with cap space at $2.7 million. They have a lot of key free agents with Chandler Jones, James Conner, A.J. Green, Christian Kirk, Zach Ertz, and Chase Edmonds, all entering uh, the free agency this year. They do not have a fourth or fifth. They The positives are the quarterback, obviously. There is so much to unpack there. We are coming out with an article soon that's discussing the quarterback carousel, and it's hard to say what's exactly happening with Kyler Murray, but it certainly seems like it's not a gimmick. It seems like there's some real credit there as to having issues of some sort. Now, whether that means he gets traded, unsure. Um, it certainly seems possible. But as of this moment, if it is Kyler, it's a positive. Their linebackers, Isaiah Simmons, uh, Zane Collins, and others, it's a very strong group. And maybe they can add another rotational pass rusher. But for the most part, it's probably going with the same group that they have now. And then the defensive backs. Their two safeties are good. Their third string safety is fine. Their corners are okay. You could probably use another corner in the room. Maybe a veteran presence but for the most part it's doable they don't necessarily need to make a, make a big move at it uh, neutral positions or wide receiver more because they're losing multiple of their pieces they have Hopkins Rondell Moore is a gadget as Jack has noted with when we've talked before and Andy Isabella hard to say whether he's going to be anything in this league or not but without AJ Green and Christian Kirk you're missing your outside guy one of your outside guys one of your versatile guys so you need to find a way to address this maybe it's in the draft um, maybe you don't really have a lot of cap room to sign one in free agency so needs to be addressed running back both of your starters are gone uh, you know benjamin has not shown to be anything more than a death beast tight ends both your starters are gone with Zach Ertz and didn't mention Max Williams, but he is a free agent as well. And the defensive line is pretty shallow with some aging guys like JJ Watt that are hurt a lot. So you gotta, you gotta figure out what you're going to do. Uh, as far as free agent fits, Leonard Fournette makes so much sense here. However, can't say this enough. They just don't have cap room. So you're gonna have to get creative. Um, Leonard Fournette is the only running back that can can fill both the Connor and Edmonds role in the free agency, we feel, as the power rusher with better upside than Connor as well as the pass catcher. Whether they actually feel like it's a big enough need to pay up for him, it's unknown. If not, Leonard Fournette, Melvin Gordon can fill the James Connor role, but you still need to find a pass catcher or at least a compliment to Melvin Gordon. Can't say it enough, they're not signing anyone without clearing cap. In the draft, we assume that all the top tackles will be gone, so you're looking at one of the second-tier offensive tackles. We haven't really studied them enough, but if you if you like one enough go get him if it's not then you know again if Linderbaum we keep using his name drafting a center is, or predicting a center's pick is hard to to say I am assuming and Jack I think would be as well that if he he's gone by now if he's not they gotta jump on this pick and again wide receiver they they're losing a bunch they can't resign them most likely so you might be looking to replace them with a first round pick pair Hopkins with whoever Garrett Wilson Jameson Williams pick your guy and run it back and just hope that you just grow as a team that is overall pretty young uh, there's not too much more to say the Cardinals except that they could be making a huge splash move there's rumors that Rodgers could go there although it, to us it doesn't doesn't make a ton of sense. Uh, if they're unhappy with Kyler and they make a dramatic move, it'll be a crazy offseason already. Uh, but if they stay put, they're probably going to make the playoffs again. Now, whether they actually are Super Bowl bound, I don't think so. Not with losing the pieces they are and the inability to re-sign them. So they're going to have to figure out something. Um, but we are going to go with uh, America's team. Jack, do you want to take it away? In the wise words of Stephen A., how about them Cowboys? Uh, this is a team that on paper does not have a lot of issues. However, as always, they are the Cowboys. They have a lot of issues. They have $21 million over the cap, which ranks them 30th. Their key free agents are up-and-comer tight end Dalton 
Schultz, uh, deep threat Michael Gallup, who we've mentioned multiple times through this series already, uh, young lineback- linebacker Leighton Van Der Esch, safety J. Ron Kirsch, and uh, wide receiver depth piece and sometimes starter Cedric Wilson. The only notes on them is that they don't have a seventh round pick, which doesn't really matter at this point. I mean, obviously guys are hit on in the seventh, but not a huge deal. The positives are pretty much everything on the offensive side of the ball. I mean, that's you're looking at the regular season because Dak Prescott disappears in the postseason. Um, running back, I mean, you have Zeke and Pollard. Personally, I believe that Pollard is going to be the starter of this room by the end of the offseason. I think that there's a very real chance that you move a guy like Zeke and his cap hit, especially with being 21 million in the hole. And Pollard, I mean, just seems so much more productive in both the running and the passing game. I don't see why you don't roll forward with him and draft someone to be um, paired with him in that room. Wide receiver, you have your starting two, Cooper and Lamb. I doubt you resign Gallup. I don't think you have the money to do that. Well, you actually don't have the money to do that. But even if you have had the money to do that. I don't think it makes sense. There's too many other holes on this team to be signing a third wide receiver. And their O-line, I mean, Dallas has been known for their O-line for how many years now? But the biggest issue with them is that they have no depth. Looking at their depth chart, you see the same like two or three names being used as backups in uh, the depth chart. So maybe mid late rounds, that's something you hit on. Maybe free agency. Again, I don't know how you're going to sign anyone, but good luck. Um, Needs to be addressed. Linebacker. Yes, they have Micah Parsons. Yes, Parsons had an incredible rookie season. However, if they don't address the edge position, Parsons is going to find himself playing a stand-up end role, which you don't want. You want him to be able to rush the passer, but not all the time. You need, I mean, they have Keanu Neal in the room, converted safety. I didn't watch enough Cowboys uh, free agent. agent. You don't have Keanu Neal. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Even if you did, he's a converted safety. So I, I mean, I don't know how, how he was at linebacker this year. Um, You have Jabril Cox, who you took in the either second or third round last year, high upside guy from LSU. Maybe he can take on one of those, those position uh, linebacker positions, but yet to be seen. And then middle of the road, tight end Blake Jarwin depending on your opinion on him is I think very mid Uh, I don't let me rephrase that you don't have the money to bring back Dalton Schultz which is unfortunate because he really is coming into his own in this league as a run blocker and a pass catcher D-line you're okay on the edge but you and even inside you're not bad per se you have some nice depth pieces but to my point before if you want Parsons to be this versatile linebacker where he plays off ball and rushes you need to get another edge on the other side of Lawrence um but how we think it'll be addressed I who knows honestly good luck you have Mike McCarthy in charge so really good luck they don't have the money they're 21 in the hole are you happy with the Dak and Amari contracts yet? Because if I'm a Cowboys fan, I'm not. Amari is considered the one on that team, but I think it's only a matter of time. And it could even be this season where we see Lamb become the one on that team. And Dak, again, kind of up and down in the regular season and disappears like that TikTok trend in the postseason. It, it's just your Dak is, and I've been saying this since he was a rookie is not worth the money and now you have him long term so now you have to make it work and I don't know if that's finding a way to bring a a guy like Schultz back but offensively again there's not that many issues like if you want to keep Dak and believe that he's the answer you need to go out and invest in the defense and I mean I said it in one of the other uh, team breakdown podcasts is Mike McCarthy needs to go to the bank and ask for a loan because this team has issues that you're not solving with 21 million dollars in debt. In terms of the draft, I think that the Cowboys are in such a weird position in the draft and that none of their needs actually fit guys that they could get at their pick. It's either going to be a reach or you got to pray to God that some of these guys slide. I think what makes the most sense here is trade your first rounder. Tr- go out and try to get one of these guys that's on the block to fill a position of need or trade back, uh, rack up the assets, get a bunch of second, third, fourth, fifth, fifth round picks and just take the depth pieces that we talked about this team needs in in the middle rounds um the only thing i do want to note about this team is trevon diggs there's a lot of controversy around his name he came in and took a huge step forward this year with 
an eight pick season. I think it was eight leading the league. I, I think I might be wrong on that, but, but he leads the league in interceptions. However, he's also the only cornerback in the last five, six, seven. I, I don't know the exact stat. I heard it was five, but I feel like it might be longer than that. But the first corner to give up over a thousand yards receiving. So yeah, you're getting the picks, you're getting the tur- turnovers, but is it, is it worth the liability? Diggs is a converted wide receiver. So yes, he doesn't have the experience at the position can can he improve absolutely there's there's nothing saying he can't he could come in next year and actually be the number one corner in the league the problem right now is people are debating whether he's overrated or not because his game relies on him getting interceptions to me personally he's a liability he's not he is not a top cornerback in the league the problem is that you look at guys like Jalen Ramsey and he doesn't have the, the interception numbers necessarily uh because he's a lockdown you're not you don't just I mean maybe the the Bengals did but you don't look at Ramsey to look at Ramsey like that's you're waiting for something bad to happen Diggs reminds me of like a Marcus Peters where like, yes, he's going to get you those interceptions, but he's also going to give up yards every time he doesn't get the interception. Dig, I'm not saying you trade Diggs, but I think a transition to safety makes a lot of sense here because Diggs is a ball hawk. He knows how to read the quarterback's eyes. He's he's always looking for ways to bait the quarterback, and that's exactly what a safety does without necessarily the responsibility of having to man a guy like DeAndre Hopkins or Julio Jones or Justin Jefferson or take your pick, whoever your favorite receiver is. Diggs can't handle that responsibility, not right now at least. And if you transition him to safety, I really do believe that he could become a top safety in this league. Let him man the middle of the field. It seems like he has the speed to, to get to the outside on fades and stuff, but it would be mind games for him. And as a guy who played receiver, he knows the inside and outs of receivers. He knows what to look for. This isn't a guy who um, has played in the secondary his whole life. He has offensive experience. He knows the keys from both an offensive and a defensive mindset. And I just think that it's something that needs to be considered because it makes all too much sense for a ball hawk. Peter, the guys like Peters, yeah all pros, pro bowls, whatever. But that was also based on on interception numbers. Look look at how, where Peters is now. I mean, he's hurt, but he's a number two. And I mean, his name isn't really thrown out there with top corners anymore because they realized what he was. The year that Xavier Howard won or was up for defensive player of the year, I can't remember if he won it, but he had the pick numbers as a clear number one. He was a mix of lockdown and and interception numbers. That's what you want from a number one corner. But that's all we got on the Cowboys and uh, yeah. With the 25th pick in the NFL draft, uh, the Buffalo Bills sit with uh, about a million and a half under the cap, which ranks them 25th in the league. They have uh, a few key free agents, including Jerry Hughes, Mario Addison, Emmanuel Sanders, and Isaiah McKenzie. The notes on their draft picks, they have an extra sixth and an extra seventh. When going through their depth chart, we agreed that the quarterback is obviously very positive. Wide receiver was a positive, but could use some depth guys with guys like Emmanuel Sanders most likely retiring and a guy like Isaiah McKenzie possibly walking. You definitely are probably going to be missing a guy there, even with Diggs and uh, Gabriel Davis. O-line, the starters are fairly strong, but it's a group that we believe needs some depth behind them in case of injury. Linebackers, Edmonds and Milano are arguably one of the best duos in the league at the backer spot and defensive back we thought is definitely a positive they could definitely use some depth at corner I mean we saw the issues that they ran into when Tredavious White went down they became Swiss cheese Um, we didn't think that there was any position that needed to be addressed like immediately but we did think that running back tight end and D-line were uh, the weakest of the position groups. And the D-line isn't even that bad. The edges, there's plenty of depth after going after guys like Boogie Basham and Rousseau last year. And I think it's just primarily getting another guy inside, either that can rush or stop the run, just um, someone to solidify the inside. How we think it'll be addressed, um, first off, you need to get out of the negatives. You're not going anywhere with that without that money. But in terms of just straight fits, uh, Tyler Conklin seems like a guy that could come in and be a nice number two to Dawson Knox. Um, Knox 
had a fairly strong year, but it's not enough to prove that he's a clear-cut one. And if the Bills want to try to run the ball a little bit more, having a number two that can block fairly well wouldn't be a bad idea. Uh, And the other fit that we have is J.D. McKissick. I mean, Singletary came on really, really strong at the end of the year, showing the type of power that he has and the reason that they picked him where he was. But I mean, Moss really hasn't seemed like anything. Breda has an injury history. Um, J.D. McKissick is a guy that could come in, and maybe he doesn't run the ball that much, but he gives Josh Allen a threat out of the backfield in the passing game, which I think is severely missed. Um, In terms of draft fits, we think you probably go with one of the top receivers left to to bring in that number three or even a depth piece. Um, If there's a corner sitting there that isn't a reach, Maybe you you go for that and bring in someone to match with uh, White and Wallace. But the truth of the matter is the 25th pick for the Bills is is a luxury pick. They can really do with whatever with it and feel pretty comfortable with where they're heading next season. I think they bring back most of the starters. I mean, again, Sanders, it just seemed like he didn't have much in the tank this year. McKenzie's a nice gadget and returner. It would be nice to see them bring him back, but you got to clear the money for that. And Hughes and Addison... Hughes has been a leader on that team for years now, but I don't know that you bring him back. I guess it depends on if he wants to come back on a veteran-friendly deal. Addison led the team in sacks, but with guys like Rousseau and Basham probably ready to step up, I don't I don't know that it's worth it. But, Zach, you have any other notes on the Bills? Uh, just something we're not projecting trades at all. However, the Bills have been heavily linked to Christian McCaffrey, and in the same way that McKissick makes sense, uh, we could see them just adding gadgets because really they have the elite one. They have an emerging wide receiver in Gabriel Davis and Beasley, and they're missing like like a McKissick or a McCaffrey or, you know, if they let McKenzie walk, it, they're missing just, just pieces because really the offense is pretty set otherwise. Um, and then going forward, we have the Tennessee Titans, the good old number one seeds getting bounced in their first game. Tennessee Titans and their cap space is actually in the negative with negative 6.6 million which is 27th in the league a majority of that is going to Ryan Tannehill because they pushed all this money back to try and bring in Julio and and uh how do you feel now I forget the exact cap hit on Tannehill but it's something nuts they are losing Ben Jones Jayon Brown Harold Landry and Rashawn Evans so basically they're starting linebacker room minus you know if you feel like David Long is a starter they do not have a second they have an extra fourth and they do not have a seventh positives are obviously Derrick Henry even with the injury this year he had his he was a lead top five in rushing yards until well into the season despite missing over half the year I expect him to come back. I know he did in the playoffs, but he didn't quite look like himself there. I expect him with a full offseason to come back the same guy. However, they really don't have a pass-catching threat, and we'll get to that in a second. Their offensive line is pretty strong, obviously. They're a really good running team. They have a good offensive line. Quarterback is neutral, especially because beyond Tannehill, they don't really have anyone that could take the, you know, if Tannehill got hurt, their backup is Logan Woodside. It's, and uh, to our surprise, Kevin Hogan is still in the league. And you just, that's not going to cut it. So maybe, they don't have a lot of cap, but maybe they signed a high-end backup somehow. Um, their wide receivers are neutral. A.J. Brown, look what happened when he was hurt this past year. Now, it, granted, there's nothing that suggests it's a pattern, but Julio is not is a, is a shell of his former self. I mean, he barely played anyway, but even when he's out there, it just doesn't feel like he has the impact that he's had for most of his career. And you need more bodies because you can't be thrown to the guys they were this year if you have an injury or two. You need depth, a lot of it. And their defensive backs are iffy. They have some, some decent pieces, but they're missing. Again, depth is a big problem here. Needs to be addressed. Tight end. Who's the starting tight end? I mean, I know who it is, but I think most people probably wouldn't know. It's Ferkser. And their defensive line beyond Simmons is very shallow. And their linebackers, they're losing most of them to free agency. So somehow with all this negative, with all with already being in the negative, they're going to have to figure out how to fill these holes. Or they risk going from first round or uh, first seed to, to not making the playoffs. Uh, as far as the free agent fits, again, with the money, J.D. McKissick makes sense here, just like he did for the Bills. He would be the perfect complement to Derrick Henry. You can't, you don't worry about him taking carry or, uh, yeah, carries. And he would just be a gadget. You know, one year he had 80 catches, and you're missing that in the room right now. Dalton Schultz makes a ton of sense as well, but we don't know how you afford him. And the same thing with Harold Landry bringing him back. Harold Landry probably wants to get paid, I would assume, but you just he's going to get a lot of money. And 
if not Landry, a lower end edge, maybe like a Dante Fowler or someone along those lines that is not going to command a lot of money. As far as the draft goes, uh, we have Devontae Wyatt as an, a member on the D-line to help out Simmons or a wide receiver to <clears throat> help A.J. Brown because can you really count on Julio at this point? Maybe he plays a quarter of the season and you're happy with that. If he gets half a season, maybe you're really happy with that. Uh, that's really all we have on the Titans. Jack, uh, you want to go with uh, a team that's had a lot of news in the offseason. Yeah, so the Tampa Bay Bucks have the 27th pick, and uh, this might be a hot take to some, but I truly do believe that the Buccaneers could be a, a first to worst candidate here. And I get that you look at this team who's been in the playoffs almost competing for Super Bowls the last two years since since Brady came in. But it really just, with the free agent class they have this year, it, it doesn't look good. I mean, you have Brady retiring, you have Godwin, uh, JPP, Ryan Jensen, Sue, Gronk, Fournette, Rojo, OJ Howard. There's just so many pieces that have been foundations of this team for the last two years. And for a team who ranks 21st in cap with around 7 million, how do you plan on re-signing these guys? Honestly, I think they're pretty lucky that Arians hasn't retired yet because if I were him, I wouldn't want the stress of this team. There's just there's too much leaving and not enough to be able to bring in what you need. The notes we have on their draft picks is that they have no sixth. That's about all we've seen. The positives of this team, we said DB, and we get that the really only like true name in this secondary is Antoine Winfield Jr. However, these other guys that may not be at a star level yet are all very, very young. Um, there's plenty of room for growth there and the potential to be one of the best young secondaries next year with another year of development. Positives, linebacker, you're losing G, uh, JPP. You still have Shaq Barrett. Uh, Joe Tryon will step into the JPP's role if you don't bring him back. So, I mean, first round talent, don't, don't lose much there. At least he has all his fingers. Um, Devin White and Levante David in the middle of the field. I mean, that's, I mean, I talk about Buffalo with Milano and Edmonds. White and David might be arguably the best in the league at what they do. Um, in terms of things that need to be addressed, if I told you last year that the Bucks would need a quarterback, would you believe me? No, probably not. But with Brady gone, I mean, you have Blaine Gabbert and Kyle Trask. Tra Trask couldn't even win his high school starting job. What is this man going to do for you? Uh, maybe with a couple years, he becomes an average backup. But for right now, you need to, to find an answer here. Um, in running back with Fournette and Rojo, maybe you bring Fournette back. But it just seems like Rojo was in the doghouse all year. I don't know that Arians is going to want to bring him back, even if he wants minimal money which I don't think is the case but um tight end you still have Cameron Brait and I think he's an okay starter but obviously I think you got to add someone to that room Gronk is either going to go somewhere else or join Brady in retirement OJ Howard has just been too injury prone for me to want to resign him um D lineman again uh Sue is on uh free agency this year and you have Vita Vea but really outside of that you're not looking at much of a room there some death pieces and you're probably missing a another starter now and then in terms of neutral positions o-line i mean this has been one of the best o-lines in the last couple of years but with jensen on free agent and maybe not being able to bring him back um but they're primarily neutral because their depth is nearly non-existent and i think we saw that in the eagles uh wild card game when kerrigan of all people was blowing up their right tackle so depth is is a clear issue here in terms of the fits we've seen a lot of stuff of them bringing Winston back and I don't know if Arians is behind that um but if Winston's eye surgery worked maybe he'll give him another chance um it's hard to imagine Godwin getting the money he wants so maybe a guy like Michael Gallup comes in and takes over that role the truth of the matter is he's not ever going to touch the one spot with Evans there but to be a number two could still be a solid spot for him and we think that that young DB room that I was talking about needs a veteran maybe a guy like Chris Harris because they don't really have like a a, a uh, slot specialist so Harris can come in and teach the young guys as well as probably take a couple snaps from the slot and running back if you don't bring Fournette back maybe a guy like Marlon Mack who wants playing time to to pair with uh, Keyshawn Vaughn and then in terms of the draft I, the only position we really thought would be here is 
one of the receivers. Now, whether that's Dotson or whoever's sitting here, I don't know how this receiver class is going to play out in terms of are they going to, are they, is it going to be uh, top 20 loaded or some of these guys going to fall? But I mean, if you can get a guy like Gallup and maybe draft one of the late first, you restore at least your receiver room, which is a start for whichever quarterback you, you try to bring in. But I mean, overall, this team has a lot of work to do. And if I told you that two years ago, with Tom Brady and the Bucks standing on the stage holding the Lombardi trophy. I'm sure no one would believe me, but this is this is a team we could see in the top 16 of picks next year. And I don't know if Zach wants to add to that or not. No, I, I think you covered a lot of it. it. It'll be interesting to see how they go about, uh, specifically with their quarterback. I think Jameis makes sense, but again, they don't have the money. And Jameis took a discount with the Saints last year, I believe, or at least he held out in hopes of another job. So he may be looking to get paid in what's a really weak quarterback year. This might be his chance for the biggest payday he'll have. And I don't see the Bucks. I mean, maybe they, again, we're not really discussing trades too much, but maybe they make a trade like many other teams are probably going to try to do. But it certainly doesn't feel like, I mean, you heard nothing about Trask and I know Brady was there, but I mean, what is, what is Trask's upside really? It can't be anything special. Um, I'll, I'll just move on to uh, the next team, and that is the Green Bay Packers, who maybe more than any other team have the most, I don't want to say drama, but news that will constantly keep updating and changing. And we will cover that in a second. They're key, or they are second worst. So 31st in the league with negative 48.4 million in cap. And that is before trying to sign their key free agents of Devontae Adams, Devondre Campbell, Robert Tanyan, and Russell Douglas. They have an extra fourth and a seventh for the draft, but no sixth. Their positives are quarterback. Now, we can go all day about this situation. It certainly, it feels like Rodgers, it, it keeps going back and forth. For anybody that watches MVP accepted speech, it almost felt like he was saying goodbye. And that that was all, I, Jack and I discussed it and it may, we were thinking he might even announce his retirement at the end of it. And he didn't. And then reports came out this week that the Packers were close to trading Jordan Love. Now we don't know how reliable those reports are, but where there's smoke, there's fire. So maybe Love is the one they're looking to move. Either way, we don't feel like both are on the team this offseason. And if they stick with Rodgers and go all in, we don't know how they're going to do it with the cap. As, as I said, they are negative 48 and that's before trying to resign Devonte, if that's even possible. Anyway, besides quarterback, which again we could spend forever talking about, their running backs are very strong. Aaron Jones and AJ Dillon are as good of a one-two punch as you will find in this league, and they pair, they complement each other very well. Their offensive line is one of the big things they're paying on their team, and they're they show out for it. They're a very good group. Their linebacker room is strong on the outside: Rashawn Gary, Zadarius Smith, Preston Smith. However, there are reports that one or more of them are going to be leaving, either being traded or cut, so that might change in a hurry. And they're inside with Devondre Campbell. I don't see how, again, I don't see how they resign him. Is pretty weak behind Chris Barnes. Their neutral positions, their defensive line starters are decent, but they don't have much depth. And their defensive back starters are okay, again, without depth. They need to be addressed, the wide receiver, without Devontae there. And I mean, even if you want to go further, Marquez Valdez Scantling is a free agent. So then you're looking at your starters being uh, Alan Lazard and Amari Rogers. You think about that what you will. It needs multiple people, but can't, you know, with what cap? Their tight end room is also weak. I personally think Tanyan is overrated and is a one-year wonder. But without him, you're looking at Josiah DeGuara, who I do like, but had multiple drops towards the end of the season. So who knows if he'll ever develop beyond the two. And I guess Jay Sternberger is still there. I'm not quite sure. But either way, if you are so, if you're sticking with Rodgers, you don't have weapons for him to throw to. And that'll be the, the narrative. If you turn to love, you don't have weapons for him to throw to and help him develop. So you're kind of in trouble here. Uh, the free agent fits. Uh, there's just nothing. There's no way. I, I just don't like, I heard a report today that somehow the Rams could get really creative and free up 60 million or 50 million in cap with, with, different contracts and extensions and pushing money. If the Packers do something crazy like that, they're still barely in the positive to, to sign anyone. I just don't, I, I don't know how you, you get it to the point where you're able to sign free agents, even with, you know, funny cap stuff, as people say, I, it's, it. I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't see they're in trouble no matter what, if they, especially if they re re up with Rogers, they could look, they could be looking at a same situation in two years that where they're 80 million, 70 million and in for like a four or five year rough stretch. As far as the draft goes, 
if you couldn't tell, we think they have receiver needs. Um, we probably put tight end here, but we don't think there's a tight end that's that's worth even a first round reach. So it's probably whichever receivers are left over of the top group, or if they're gone, you could use Quay Walker on the defense. Um, it should be one of the more interesting free agencies in recent memory and off seasons in general for the Packers. So Packers fan, uh, we hope you're ready, but we will uh, keep chugging along here. Jack, go ahead. Uh, before I start with the next pick, I just wanted to circle back to what Zach was talking about with the quarterbacks. And I mean, sitting here thinking about it, the unfortunate part, is that Matt LaFleur can't win because if you keep if you keep both quarterbacks you look stupid because you could get something for one of them if you trade Love, you're all in on Rodgers. However, you don't have the future. If you trade Rodgers and Love doesn't look ready to go, you look stupid. Like there, you, you literally can't win no matter what move you try to make here. And to Zach's point, I texted him during the MVP speech and I was like, this dude is about to retire. Like, what is he doing? And then the next day to his point, he the Packers are saying they're willing to move Love to keep Rodgers and offer him the most money of any quarterback in the league. And then we saw the reports about love being traded and then i saw something today about um hackett in denver wanting to bring in rogers now does roger keep his allegiance to green bay and retire a packer or does he go to a team who could potentially be a quarterback away with receiving weapons that if you put everything that rogers have ever has ever put or had together just i mean right, maybe that's a bold statement but has better receivers than rogers has had in the last five or six years but i just i think it's a really bad look for lafleur if you trade either one of them or either way to to the point of the cap is whoever you keep, you're not bringing in weapons. So this team is another one that could probably go from uh, first to worst. Like, I don't, I don't know what your plan is here. But moving along, the San Francisco 49ers have the 29th pick this year. Sitting with a whopping $3 million in cap, they rank 23rd. Uh, their, free, their key free agents are Mostert. Lakin Tomlinson, who I re heard reports, is trying to sign an extension after his Pro Bowl caliber season. And yes, I get it. The Pro Bowl doesn't mean anything anymore, but it still proves that you're among the league's best. And Butterhands Jaquisky Tart is also there. Um, in terms of draft pick notes, they have no first. Um, hopefully Lance works out for you. And they have an extra third for tr for losing the Rodrigo Blankenship lookalike. Um, in terms of their depth chart, running back is obviously a positive, And I don't think that it will ever be a negative with this team. I just think that Shanahan's system is so running back friendly that you're, you're bound to succeed. Um, I mean, you look at Atlanta and Devontae Freeman pretty much fell off the map after he left. Mustard became an all pro when he came or whatever he would. Pro Bowl or all for whatever with uh, Shanahan out in the Niners. Mitchell out of nowhere. The only one that can't be explained is Trey Sermon. For a guy that ran over people and jumped over people and in the college football playoffs, where has he been? Like, ever, when Mostert went down, you would think that it's Trey Sermon coming in. And then all of a sudden you have Eli Mitchell coming out of nowhere. And it's like, what is going on here? I mean, Mitchell obviously had a great season, but it's just like, where's Sermon at? Um, tight end is obviously a positive with Kittle, but we see much like the Raiders, what happens when your one isn't there. Werner and uh, Dwelly are the backups. I mean, those are pretty average, maybe below average backups. I think you need to add another guy, especially for a system like Shanahan that runs a lot. Um, D line obviously positive has been for years now and I don't know what it is about John Lynch and Kyle Shanahan but they can pick linebackers in the mid rounds like it's nothing Warner Al Shahir, Greenlaw, like these, this is inc an incredible group all drafted by the now GM and coach. And the biggest issue here is that they have, I think, two, two backups. So um, in terms of things that need to be addressed, defensive back, Tart needs to just walk. Jimmy Ward is not an impressive starter in any means. The only the only positive this year was Ambry Thomas, who they took in the mid round last year. A physical man-to-man -man corner who made a name for himself early on, not at a Pro Bowl level or anything, but um, there's definitely a lot to work with there and should be happy if you're the 49ers. And you got guys like Mosley and Williams who are probably slightly above average, but they, uh, they definitely need a lot of work, both at safety and at corner. Um, in terms of the free agent fits, uh, you need money to do anything. 
I heard they're trying to re-sign Tomlinson, but again, you need money for that. But I mean, even if you walk into the playoff or next season with the same team, you probably find a way to make the playoffs. It just seems like Shanahan is that type of a coach. And the truth of the matter is the offense stays intact. Only difference is you most likely walk in with a quarterback that can do it all. Um, You probably trade Jimmy, so that probably um, opens up some cap room for you. And in terms of the draft fits, again, you don't have a first rounder, so I hope Lance worked out for you. But um, I don't know if Zach has any opinions on the Niners before we move on. No, I I think uh, uh, this this team – Maybe there's a new uh, level that this offense can reach with Trey Lance. It's hard to know. Certainly, it seems like the offense Shanahan wants to run is more with a player like Trey Lance versus Jimmy Garoppolo. They're probably getting another pick from a Jimmy Garoppolo trade. Now, what round that is? Jack sent me a report today that Washington was possibly sending their first, which would be insane. And if they were somehow able to, to fleece a first for Garoppolo, that would be nuts. But either way, you think they get an extra pick in the first three rounds and they just continue building this team and run it back and hope that one of these years it breaks right for Shanahan and he finally wins the game that seems ever elusive to him right now. That's all I have. And I really hope Trey Lance works out because I was a fan of his coming out of uh, college and we will, time will tell. But the next team is the Kansas City Chiefs. They are 22nd in the league with 3.7 million in cap. Their key free agents are Honey Badger, Tyron Matthew, Orlando Brown. A few of their backup are receivers like Byron Pringle and Demarcus Robinson, as well as backup running backs, Jarek McKinnon and Daryl Williams. And Melvin Ingram, who maybe is a key free agent, he played an important role, it felt like, in the playoffs. Their draft pick notes, they have an extra third from the Ryan Poles signing, and no fifth or sixth, and two extra sevenths. Their positives are obviously quarterback. However, just something to note, I can't say I've ever noticed an NFL fan base unite in hatred against a team purely for the fact of a player's family that has nothing to do with the player. I mean, I have nothing against the Chiefs, but everybody wanted the Bengals to win. And I got to be honest, while the Bengals had a weird cult following a little bit, it had all to do with with seeing Mahomes' wife and brother not involved. And that is just hilarious. And I just don't know that we'll ever see anything like that again. And it's just in a weird way, it's something to look out for because it's never happened before that I can think of where a family member has caused such hatred. I don't know. It's just a weird thing in football. Maybe it becomes something more. Maybe it doesn't. Um, tight end. They've got probably the best tight end in football. He's the Iron Man at tight end. He doesn't miss snaps. But at some point, you worry he's going to break down. I mean, he's over 30 now. So it'd be nice if they add you know, a second round or a third round tight end or, you know, a lower and a lower level free agent just to have some depth because Kelsey is their offense with along with Tyree Kill. And if Kelsey were to get hurt, who knows what would happen that you would imagine it comes to a grinding halt. A defensive line, they have solid depth. It seems like they're missing a starter there. Running back is a neutral position. Clyde Edwards Hilaire when healthy looks good. And his injuries have kind of been, in my opinion, freak injuries. They just don't have the depth, but they probably resign one or both of their backups and I mean Derek Gore seemed okay so we have them at neutral but could they really use some depth wide receiver is neutral because Tyree Kill is so unguardable and Miko Hardman is a nice I mean three or four and he's a nice gadget they're missing a starter they're you know we'll talk about that in a second the offensive line their interior offensive line is really good Creed Humphrey had one of the best rookie center seasons maybe ever I believe and their guards are good they're missing tackles especially with Orlando Brown being a free agent the reports are he wants to resign but the Chiefs don't have that much money so not sure how that's going to work their linebackers, they have two good linebackers in Willie Gay and Bolton, but they're missing a third starter because it just doesn't seem like Anthony Hitchens is that is that good. If not, if they if you feel like Hitchens is a starter, they're still missing depth. Uh, the absolute needs to be addressed is defensive back with Tyron Matthew probably leaving to get a big payday. The corners are okay. Sorensen's still there some for some reason. I mean, it's just all you need to know that. It's it's bad enough that Sorensen has a role in this room. Um, as far as free agent fits, to me, this screams Allen Robinson, and it, it just feels like Robinson's been catching passes. I know we said this for uh, a few other teams that have great quarterbacks, and now the Chiefs don't have the money, but maybe Robinson doesn't care about the money. 
and then he finally wants to catch passes from a good quarterback. Robinson fits in with a few different teams, but this is one of the big ones for me. Again, I think Darrell Williams resigns or Jarek McKinnon resigns, and a veteran corner that wants to win. Maybe Patrick Peterson, uh, maybe Kyle Fuller. It, it's not really. It's somebody that will be looking to take a pay cut to win. And now maybe there's not many out there, but as far as draft fits, if there's a corner there that's not a reach, you know, maybe McDuffie or McCreary if they're there. A wide receiver, again, whoever's left of the top group or a second tier offensive tackle, if there's one there that you like and you go get them. We'll see uh, the saga of the family develop and if it becomes more than just something that happened in the playoffs. But otherwise, the Chiefs are set up to, to they're, they're lacking depth on some key places, but they'll probably be the number one seed in the West or at least a wild card team and right in the heat of the Super Bowl favorites. Uh, we are closing in on our two Super Bowl teams. So, Jack, you want to start us off here? I would just like to say, Chiefs fans, you better pray to God that the Juju Smith-Schuster rumors aren't true. With the 31st pick, sits the Cincinnati Bengals. Um, this is a team, surprisingly, that has the fourth most cap room in the NFL this year sitting at around $49 million. They have some key free agents, though, in Jesse Bates and C.J. Uzoma. Zach, Zach, that doesn't count. Riley Reef doesn't count. <laughs> um, positives, obviously quarterback, running back, especially with the emergence of P. Ryan. Um, obviously not a starter in this league, but a very, very nice backup for Mixon. Receiver, that's got to be arguably the best trio in football, especially with the Cowboys losing Gallup. I don't think there's anyone that can come close to that. Um, D-line, nice depth at the end spots. Um, nice starters inside. However, you do need some depth moving forward. Uh, Reader, a guy that very strong in the run, doesn't generate enough pressure, in my opinion, to to play three down. So maybe you get a rusher inside that plays situationally. And their linebacker room is pretty strong. Wilson has come into his own as um, one of the best coverage linebackers in the league. And Pratt is showing out uh, as well. So it's possible that they're missing maybe a starter, maybe a couple depth pieces. But overall, that's a pretty strong room. Um, Neutral, we said, was tight end. I think Uzoma gets re-signed. I think it would be hard to see a guy who really stepped up in a leadership role when they got into the playoffs just let him walk. But behind him is uh, Drew Sample. I don't know how he's developed. He... He might be a good backup, but maybe you, you just add someone to the room in case something happens to use Oma again. Needs to be addressed. I don't think it needs to be said. Offensive line, defensive back. Um, Eli Apple is burnt toast. Vernon Hargraves has zero awareness. And the O-line is, I'd say Swiss cheese, but that that doesn't even do justice for how bad this team, this offensive line is. Um, in terms of free agent fits, you got to think that the Bengals at least offer Jesse Bates an extension. I don't see how you can let him walk. Um, Bates has shown to be one of the top safeties in this league. And if you have 48 million in cap and just let him walk, that's really not a good look on you. Unless there's something behind the scenes that maybe we don't know, but it would be on the surface, like a really bad look for this team. Um, Minimal, you need four linemen. That's just to cover the four starting spots that aren't Jonah Williams. I mean, Max, I mean, you probably sign four starters, four backups, uh, maybe five, maybe trade for somebody. Who knows? Um, and in terms of, I mean, I guess the team in general, I guess maybe the corner room a little bit more than anything, a veteran who wants to win. Again, to Zach's point with Kansas City is maybe Pat Pete, maybe Kyle Fuller. But any guy who's who wants to come win for a chief would be a nice addition to a team that really wasn't supposed to be in the position that they were. This is a team that, for the most part, everyone thought was going to be fourth in their division. Here they sit at the 31 pick. Um, in terms of draft fits, um, cornerback, if not a reach. And uh, again, if you could draft 3 0 linemen with one pick, I would do it. But to Zach's point, if you could choose a, a six round lineman at the 31st pick, I'm sure they would be better than what they had last year. Um, that's, that's the only notes we have on Cincinnati. I just wanted to throw in an interesting stat I saw. I was on Twitter. And I saw that Andrew Luck was trending. I was like, oh, this is, I, I wonder what this is about. And it was a bunch of people comparing Joe, Joe Burrow to Andrew Luck. And one of the, the stats that I saw was that in their first 30 games, respectively, Luck was sacked 73 times. Burrow was sacked 102 times. First off, that is a 30 sack difference for the same amount of games. Second off, if you do the math, Burrow played 20 games this season. 
He was sacked 70 times, 19 of which were in the playoffs. That is three less sacks taken than Luck in 10 less games. If Luck was feeling the pain that badly to want to retire, what is Burrow going to do? Burrow already has the torn ACL. He already was screaming in pain at the Super Bowl. This is not a guy, and I do not like Joe Burrow, so there is no bias here. If he is your franchise quarterback, you need to protect him at all costs. And I was talking to my dad, and he said that there was a report that the Bengals O-line coach said, well, our offensive line got us here. With a little extra work, they could take us to the win. Absolutely not. Did 103 sacks in Burrow's first 30 games. The stats speak for themselves. This dude needs to be fired just for the words that he said. Because Burrow, uh, I think the official diagnosis was an MCL sprain. And that's lucky. Because if it was his MCL, it could have been a tear. And all of a sudden, now you're really looking at a potential Andrew Locke. You, and I know we joked about, hey, you, you should sign nine, nine free agent linemen and draft three with the 31st pick. But in all seriousness, you need to protect this guy. And again, I do not like him, but I do not want to see this kid get hurt because, I mean, he's one of the future quarterbacks in the NFL that are going to replace legends like Ben Roethlisberger, like Eli Manning, Rodgers, Breeze, Brady. The AFC is stacked with young guys. Lamar, uh, Deshaun Watson, if he ever clears whatever the hell is going going on there. Josh Allen, Mahomes, Justin Herbert. The only difference is that the Chiefs, after they lost the Super Bowl, invested money into their line. The Bills have money invested into their line. The Chargers have money invested into their line. These guys are doing everything right, and the Bengals are sitting here letting Burrow get killed. And if they really do not address the O-line position in the way that it needs to be addressed this offseason, if I was Joe Burrow, I would sit out in the offseason until Either they sign me some linemen or or trade me because I'm not going to kill myself for this team. And I get that Burrow might be a team player, but not if it means your career is cut 10, 11, 12, 13 years short because your knees literally are made of nothing anymore. Um, I know that was a long rant, but... I don't know if got, Zach's got anything to add to that. Um, I just wanted to say I looked it up, and it was actually Zach Taylor that said that about the line, not the offensive line coach, which is worse – most likely. I mean, if I'm a Bengals fan, if I'm Joe Burrow, I'm hoping it's just coaches speak because he was saying that they can scheme better, call better plays, but like, what are you going to call? It's not Ghostbusters. You know, you, you just, anybody that watched that game, look at the last play of the game. You double team Donald and it doesn't work. That's a problem. Joe Burrow, Ramsey fell down. If Burrow has two more seconds to get to the read, it's a touchdown and maybe the Bengals just win this. Maybe that's a walk-off touchdown. The Bengals win the Super Bowl whole different story but he didn't have the time when the game mattered most you knew who was going to be giving it all Aaron Donald how how if you're the left guard and the center which I believe was where the double team was how does he get through let someone else beat you and yet he went right through him it took no time at all I know Donald's an all-time great but like this highlights the problem you two of you can't even hold him away for three seconds I'm pretty sure it was two seconds and he was in there. And it's just, it's insane to think that you, I know you've got to like keep your team morale up and all, but there's problems. And to Jack's point, there needs to be multiple linemen signed and maybe drafted. This isn't a one lineman fixes everything type of situation. You could see the Bengals with their cap space go and get the top three, top four offensive linemen in free agency, and nobody would critique them for it. Nobody would say it's a waste of money. So we'll see. Uh, Hopefully it's not just coaches speak, but I'm going to continue to our final team on this preview breakdown of the 2022 offseason with the Super Bowl champion, Los Angeles Rams. As everyone seen, their Super Bowl parade was today. Matt Stafford was hammered. And it was a very funny, there's some very funny things out of that. Um, but let's just get into it. They're 28th in the league with cap space with negative 13.1. As it stands right now, I, I like I said, in, with the Packers, I saw a report that said there was a way with, I think, four separate players that they move their contract money around. They could clear up like 40 or 50 or 60 million. But we're not talking about that. We're talking about as it stands right now. Key free agents are Von Miller, Darius Williams, Sonny Michelle, OBJ, and Austin Corbett. They traded their first to the Lions. I think they traded their second to the Lions as well for Stafford. Obviously, you're probably feeling good about that. Uh, unlike any other of the first that have been traded, 
away, this is the one that has the results already. And you got your Super Bowl. You might not make it back again for the rest of Stafford's career for the next 10 years, but you you put it all in on this year and it worked. So congratulations to the Rams. I don't think they're going to be sad that they don't have a first or second because I think most teams would trade that for a Super Bowl 10 out of 10 times. They also don't have a fifth, but they do have two extra sixth and seventh, an extra seventh, so watch out there. You might find some superstars late. Uh, they're positive quarterback, obviously. Uh, Stafford put him over, and the reason you brought in Stafford was f- on full display. I mean, by now, a lot of people have probably seen the no-look pass to Cooper Cup on the final drive. It's just, like, mind-blowing to think of the spotlight that was on. And this man had the nerve to throw a no-look pass to Cooper Cup for, I think it was a 20-yard play. And nobody even noticed it at first. I, I didn't see it until two days later when they started realizing, hey, this is how crazy this was. Do you think Jared Goff makes that play? No. Heck no. This isn't a bash Jared Goff session. But the point is, you've got your quarterback for the next probably three seasons unless he retires quickly, maybe even longer. And I hope to see Stafford put together four really strong years or three really strong years and show that Detroit really is a black hole and that he's actually one of the best quarterbacks in the last 20 years. Hopefully that's, that's the goal. Uh, Wide receiver, obviously Cooper cup, otherworldly season. Uh, I believe I saw all time, including the playoffs. He had 500 more yards than the next closest receiver. He had one of the best regular seasons of all time, one of the best playoff runs of all time, and a crazy good Super Bowl where when it mattered the most and they needed the game-winning touchdown, he got three targets in a row. The first one he caught and took a headshot, but it got called back to offsetting penalties. Dumb. The second one, he got held by everyone's favorite burnt toast, Eli Apple. And the third one, he, he juked out Apple again. Because why? I don't know. Because it's Eli Apple. Because for some reason they, they thought the ball was going anywhere else. I, I don't know. But Cup was there. He made the play. And I think he even had four catches or five catches on the final drive. Um, I'm a huge Cooper Cup fan, if you can't tell. But besides him, Robert Woods should be back. And Robert Woods is a very good number two. Uh, Van Jefferson looked extremely weak when it mattered most. And Skoranek, anyone saw the interception what was that? I mean, you just basically handed the ball to the defense. Uh, he just did in the playoffs in general. He looked really bad. He had a drop against, I think it was the Bucks. That was just an ugly, ugly drop. So I wouldn't be surprised if he's not on the roster next year. They need, they need one more body, probably number three. So that Vash, uh, Van Jefferson, Van Jefferson, slides to the four or the five because it just doesn't seem like there's anything there right now but you could do that with a third round draft pick you could do that with a guy that takes a huge pay cut to win tight end is you know they're not the best group out there but if this playoff showed anything they're they're very good with depth I mean beyond Tyler Higby there's uh I'm blanking Bryson Hopkins and I there's a third stringer that really stepped up to the playoffs and his name is escaping me and obviously their defensive line is really good. Again, something where the depth really showed off in the playoffs when they needed it. Sean Robinson, Greg Gaines, these kind of guys that they picked late or was just not a superstar are starting to come into their own. And Donald today at the parade, I believe it was, said he wants to run it back. So if he means it, that's a huge sigh of relief, I'm sure, for all Rams fans and for the Rams coaching staff. Neutral positions are the running back. Look. Cam Akers, it's a great story coming back from his Achilles tear and his, the amount of time that he did, but he just didn't look good at, at all. To me, he looked, even when he wasn't fumbling the ball and trying to give the game away, he looked non-explosive. He looked adequate at best. I mean, to me, Sony Michelle looked better. And Daryl Henderson is a nice backup, but he's hurt all the time too. So you need another body there. Uh, the offensive line, pending a few factors, including Whitworth's retirement, is neutral. It could be good if Whitworth comes back um, among, I believe, uh, Corbett. But you could also, again, the Rams are in a position now where people will be taking play, pay cuts to play for you. So they could fill out the line without an issue. The defensive backs, the starters are decent. They have no depth. Um, they have no depth at all. But this is the way that the, the Rams built this team. It's a win at all one year. This is what you're going to have to deal with. Uh, They'll probably bring back um, some guys, you know, just fill it in with guys and hope that your offense bails out. If Ramsey, if this is the start of a decline for Ramsey that the playoffs showed, that's a problem. But as it stands right now, you assume he'll be the lockdown man that he is. And then you just got to find guys. Veterans that'll take pay cuts again. And then needs to be addressed linebacker. They're like the Philadelphia Eagles. Rarely do they have a lot invested, especially in the middle linebackers, but they're still missing pieces. Von Miller, I don't think he resigns. I think he's going to get one last payday before he retires. 
So I just don't see the Rams doing it. Maybe I'm wrong, but again, you'll find guys and maybe they don't, um, maybe they don't make it back, but they should be competitive and playoff bound. Again, we talked about the free agents a lot. It seems more important to re-sign your guys and then worry about bringing in other people. And if you can't do it, then you're going to be looking for guys that take pay cuts. As far as the draft goes, they don't have a first or a second. And like I said, for me personally, I would be trading a first and a second for a Super Bowl every time. But at some point, this is go- the bill is going to come due, and you're going to have a lot of aging pieces on your team without any young players to replace it. But maybe by that time, they've been to the playoffs three straight, four straight, five straight years, and it's just nobody's going to criticize them for it. So time will tell on that one. Jack, do you have any other closing notes on the Rams and in general? Uh, just to touch on a couple of things is I think that after this year, there's a chance that Miller gets a payday. But if he really thinks that there's a way that this team can say stay semi together, I think he resigns on a veteran deal and tries to chase a third ring because I think a third ring and another good season, which I think is most likely going to happen in LA with guys like Donald and Floyd next to him could solidify him for a hall of fame spot someday, maybe not first ballot, but someday Um, acres again, I know that he's coming off an Achilles tear and I get that that's probably the worst injury you can, can suffer in the league, but he just, he looked, he looked scared. He didn't look the same. He wasn't as explosive. And honestly, the fumbles, if I had to take a guess, probably had to do with him worried more about his Achilles than than him actually uh, losing the ball. I, I mean, I don't think he had a history, uh, history of fumbling. I, I don't know much about him. But when you fumble twice in, I think it was the Green Bay game, why? I think it was the Tampa game. Well, anyway, it doesn't yeah, well, it, whichever game it was, I mean, this dude was selling hard. I've seen Madden players sell less hard than that. And I just, Akers is like, he's given the game away and you have Sony Michelle and I get it. Michelle isn't the talent level of a Barkley or Zeke in his first couple of years or any of those guys, but ball security was never an issue for him so why are you risking the game for a guy coming off a july achilles tear i don't care if you want to give acres the ball but it can't be acres gets 99 percent of the snaps it make it made absolutely no sense and i if he really did sell on that game and they lost i wonder what would happen to him the fact that they won a super bowl probably saves him but he ran for literally just barely above one yard of carry in the Super Bowl. So, I mean, I don't know. And then the last thought on the Rams is the Rams did something that every team who's ever uh, been in contention for a Super Bowl has dreamed of, using the trade deadline to build your team. Miller and OBJ came in right in around the trade deadline. And there's teams who year in and year out make moves to try to make that to make that push and no one succeeds the rams i get it you don't have a first and you don't have a second this year you don't have a fifth and i god only knows what you're missing in the next three years combined from all these trades you're making but to zach's point at least you have the extra seven you'll find something um but the they unlike the saints who didn't use the trade deadline they just invested money and money into their team for a Super Bowl. And I get they got screwed over. It seemed like seven years in a row, um, but they weren't able to complete the mission. The Packers, they, I mean, with the exception of Adams uh, and the receivers room, they invested money into everything else and they couldn't do it. You watch all these teams either invest money or trade for these key st- these key guys and it doesn't work out. And the Rams are the first team, I think, in history to win a Super Bowl by building in the way that they did. And I mean, the one thing I know it is like Matt Rule trading for Steph on Gilmore because he thought they could make a playoffs funny but um in all seriousness uh, congratulations to the Rams on their Super Bowl win uh very well deserved um for so many of those guys from Donald who finally gets his ring I'm not an OBJ fan but OBJ who finally gets a ring even though he got hurt Eric Weddle for coming back two years out of retirement and getting his ring there's so many guys Whitworth there's so many guys on this team who deserved it so um congrats to them (laughs) 